On today's show, Hyundai unveils a stunning AV, Mazda wants to go green, but Toyota does. That, and a little bit more. Good day, everyone. My name is Chris, and well, this is your show about everything happening in Australia and well, from around the world sometimes in the space of renewable technologies like electric vehicles, batteries, solar storage, hydro, you name it. If it's tech, I try to cover it. If you're new to the channel, Welcome, subscribe, it does seriously support the channel. You want to take it to the next level? Join these guys over here, where on Patreon you get exclusive behind the scenes content, early access polls, and what a lot more that you just don't get here. And big shout out to my producers, Ashley Hill, Nigel Farrier, Ray Johnson, and Tessa Nagong for supporting me at the producer level. Um, so, and hey, one last one, quick shout out. Uh, thanks to Tesla Taxi Australia. If you want to try a Tesla and give it a rent for a day, three days or a week, check them out. These guys have got cars in New South Wales, Queensland, ACT, Victoria and South Australia. And if you want to experience what actually driving a Tesla is like, give them a bit of a look up and use my code YTV38 and you can save some money, especially for this month where maybe you need to commute between, you know, different cities of Australia. There's a, there's a way to do that quite cheaply and it doesn't involve a plane. And hint, it kind of involves a, a Tesla, an autopilot. It's pretty awesome. All right. Now, this is going to be a relatively short show because I'm just trying to get my schedule back to where it used to be. Not that I had much of a schedule, but I tried. And that was to get a news episode like this one out on Mondays. And well, today um, we're going to be doing yeah, a shorter news one. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. In a new walk around video, Hyundai Motor Group's Chief Design Officer, Luke Donkawalki, apologies if I just said that wrong, and I probably did, explains some of the key features inside and out of the vehicle. And as a reminder, I only bring you concept cars on the show if the maker has stated that it will bring it to market. So with that said, I give you a car with no steering wheel. Instead you get not one, but two joysticks to steer the car. Futuristic? Maybe? This Hyundai States not only allows for a more comfortable seating position while driving, it also frees up more space on the dashboard for other features. In addition, 90% of the vehicle's functions can be controlled via buttons on the joysticks, so there is no need for the driver to take their hands off the joysticks to change the music. Pretty cool, huh? And I guess in doing so, it's paving the way for autonomous driving future, which is why more and more car makers like GM, Google, Waymo, Holden, Holden, Holden that's hilarious, Holden, bye bye, see ya, um, Honda and more are unveiling cars without a steering wheel at all. Uh, and by the way, Saab was actually the first to try this back in the 1980s, but I guess that the tech wasn't quite up to scratch back then. Returning to the prophecy, it's built on the Electric Global Modular Platform, or EGMP, or EGUMP as I like to call it, means that there is no need for a wide front hood or a bulky center console. This allows designers to reclaim the space for passenger use and to reimagine the range of like in-car experiences that you can do. Which again, is one of the reasons that Hyundai moved the steering wheel to joysticks as to like optimize the entertainment space. The infotainment system is integrated into a large screen stretching across the entire front of the vehicle's interior. Specs about performance, range, and etc. haven't been revealed, but there is one more interesting tech piece going on here, and that is that the dual pane glass is actually locked in place and will come lowered. Um, you see, what Hyundai has said that they're, they're actually going to be doing with this thing is that it will have the cleanest air not only inside the cabin, but also outside the cabin. How? Through a unique air filtration system with a fine dust sensor built into the vehicle. When particulate levels inside the vehicle get too high, the air system activates, taking in fresh air from the outside, filtering it out for impurities, and circulating that clean air throughout the vehicle. And should that fresh, extremely clean air inside the car not be needed, it gets pumped out to the outside. Therefore, you get clean air inside and out. Huh, clever. So, what do you think? How would you feel about driving a car with joysticks? For me, I don't see why not, as like we've all had to learn to move the car by like turning a wheel or using accelerator and brake with our feet. And it's amazing to think that we can go like very, very slow or crazy fast just through a few centimeters of travel with that happy pedal. But 
Why does Hyundai think that we actually need two joysticks? Pilots flying like Airbus aircraft use just one stick and the, the, the aircraft are inherently more complex to control due to the, like the three axes of movement. And hold up to my keyboard warriors out there, I know that there's actually like rudder pedals for, um, you know, to control an aircraft with, but a pitch and yaw are achieved just with that stick. So yeah, that's more than the, uh, the two different ways that we control cars. Mm. Anyway, so I want your thoughts. Poll time. Doop, right up there. Would you be happy driving a car with a joystick? Answer it now and yeah, I'd like to hear from you. Next week, I'll post the results. A term we're hearing more and more about and how companies are progressing to like a cleaner, greener future. Sometime in the tw next 20 or 30 years, which if you ask me, it's gotta to be too late because well, the CO2 that we emit today will be circulating in our environment for like the next, the next 200 years. And so I'm conflicted, why? Because one of my favorite car makers is persisting with burning stuff and won't releasing CO2 in the environment. Mazda is currently involved in joint research projects and studies to promote the widespread adoption of biofuels from microalgae growth. As part of a sustainable Zoom Zoom 2030 long-term technology development program, the company has committed to reducing its average well-to-wheel -well CO2 emissions um, to 50% of 2010 levels by 2030 and 90% by 2050. Expecting that internal combustion engines combined with some form of electrification will still account for some like 95% of the vehicles it produces in 2030. Now, Master believes, and will most likely true, that liquid fuel will remain the dominant energy source in the, motor, in the automotive industry until at least 2040. Now, Master considers a renewable liquid fuel essential to that drastic CO2 reduction, because when burnt, algae biofuel only releases a CO2 that it recently removed from the atmosphere via photosynthesis. Like, as the algae grew, so, Massa considers its development to be critical to achieving the carbon neutrality of cars powered by the internal combustion engine. Microalgae biofuel has numerous positive attributes as a renewable liquid fuel. Algae fuel can be like obtained in a short amount of time, producing 20 to 40,000 litres of fuel per year per acre. That's seriously impressive, especially when it's growing and multiplying and can be harvested daily. Other benefits include a high CO2 uptake and can be farmed on land that's unsuitable for like agriculture with minimal impact on freshwater resources using either sea or even wastewater. In addition, algae fuel has like a high flash point. It's biodegradable and relatively harmless to the environment if it's spilled. So let me just pause for a moment because well, think about it. CO2 into the plant, but then you burn it, then CO2 out of the plant. That's bad, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I diverge. Electric transport is our future and I believe in it because technology like solar, wind and hydro have a tiny CO2 footprint which can be offset or neutralized by like planting trees. You know, these things that soak up CO2. Now, contrast that with how you get algae biofuel. It's complex, it's energy and resource intensive and mimics the failings of current fueling methods. In 2020, scientists still haven't been able to make the stuff without putting in way more energy than you actually get out of it. Plus, and well, here's a deal breaker, I reckon. It costs three times as much to produce one litre of this compared to all other petroleum products. And it fails by building on a fuel system that is fundamentally flawed and uses up resources to convert it in factories to fuel, store it, transport that fuel to like petrol stations, store it again, and then cars or trucks fill up on it. It's something that we're doing for more than 100 years. Meanwhile, in a renewable future near you, electricity is transported from where it's generated or stored straight to one of hundreds of millions of power points. And well, surprise, surprise, which one is cleaner, cheaper, easier, and like more energy efficient? Electricity, of course, yes. So to me, algae is a biofuel that is not a transition, definitely not an evolution nor revolution. No, it's a distraction. Mazda is trying to hold on to the good old internal combustion engine model for as long as possible. The complexity of an engine with its thousands of moving parts means that things break and need replacing. And this is where the money is at. Keeping consumers tied to this way of getting us around is what is keeping us poor and well, from saving the world. 
And don't get me wrong, I want Mazda and any car maker or petrol producer to get us to net zero emissions as soon as possible, but research that I've done on this, and the links are below, has gotten nowhere in the last 20 years. And uh, yeah, I think there are other energy methods out there that are a lot more promising and nowhere near as complex. And Mazda, come on, you make great compelling cars, focus on getting some great EVs out there. Okay, time for a quick round of bites. These are quick short news items making the news this last week. And first up, in a rather timely contrast to my last story, Toyota Motor Corporation in conjunction with Chabu Electric Power Co and Toyota Tusu Corporation have established Toyota Green Energy. And that's to move the Toyota Group to renewable energy sources. This renewable energy business has been backed by for the next 30 years. And you will see the development of power stations with a focus on like wind power, and solar power generation. Climateworks Australia has just released an important report, Solutions, Actions and Benchmarks for the Net Zero Emissions Australia, which shows that if Australia is to reach its Paris Agreement targets, we will need to be using 79% from renewable energy sources by 2030. Currently at like 23% as of today, that's this date down here, that means that forecasts for 35% in the next two years, well, we've got a long way to go. 23% now, a few years time, 35%, 79%, we've got a long way to go, haven't we? Yeah, okay, but I diverge. The report looks at emissions from multiple angles like energy, buildings, transport, and more and more, and found that if we were to go down the 1.5 degree pathway, that, that's this thing here, then 75%, or that's three out of every four new cars sold, will have to be electric by year 2030. From last week's show, you know that EVs only account for like 0.2% of all new car sales in Australia. So again, there's lots to do here, people. Fortunately, Anna Scarbeck, the Climate Works Chief Executive, is optimistic and said that these results are not out of reach in Australia and can be achieved using technologies that are mostly already mature and available today. Australian e-machine builder Hydropower has commenced production of its QFM 360X. The company claims to be the world's first megawatt extreme duty unit. Despite its diminutive size of just 43 centimeters, one single QFM 360 can produce up to one megawatt, that's like 1,000 kilowatts of power. The motor can run by itself or with up to 10 motors uh, running parallel or conjunction rather, producing a total of 10,000 kilowatts. Like crikey. Eh, and wait, wait, it gets better. Top EV Racing have placed four of these motors into a drag cast chassis that produces 4,000 kilowatts of power and it's hoped to break the land speed record to zero to 20 kilometers an hour in just 0.8 of a second. And they'll do that reaching 400 kilometers per hour in 2.9 seconds and then 530 kilometers per hour in just 3.7 seconds. My goodness, that would be extraordinary. Now, the team that aims to take out eight world records with their vehicle, including like a land speed record of about 612 kilometers an hour, are able to use in not only like vehicles, but they're also developing this motor for use in like light rail and high speed rail applications. Okay, time for one last segment. And this week's FYI, that's like a short two minute piece designed to get the facts straight around renewables, EVs, and more and more, is going to counter the argument that there is no consensus around who is to blame for climate change. Citing in particular, like scientists don't even agree. So in a moment, I'll record the segment, but to ensure that that, you know, that someone you see on social media gets a message to, I published like a short two minute version located up there and we're also down there in a little um, playlist I like to call FYI. So when that person writes that, oh, not even scientists can agree that there's actually such a thing as climate change, um, yeah, just, just put this little two minute video into the uh, space and hopefully they'll watch it. Okay, you ready? Here we go. More than 31,000 scientists agree there is no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide will, in the foreseeable future, cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere. Really? Let's talk about that. The Global Warming Petition, located on the Climate Denial website, is led by outspoken physicist, the late Dr. Frederick Seitz, 
former president of the US National Academy of Sciences, who, by the way, supported tobacco companies' claims that smoking was good for you. Hmm. This infamous petition asked anyone with a degree in any science domain, that's, that's like 31,487 by 2008, to sign it if they think that climate change is not real. So, of those 31,000, who actually have a degree in climate science? Just 0.1%. So I ask, would you agree with Karen or Frank from Facebook or Twitter if their facts are supported by just 0.1 of 1%? You wouldn't, would you? So, yet, you see headlines like this, this, and this. And how do they do it? Well, it turns out it's quite easy. What they do is they cherry pick data, put up a fake expert, make false illogical conclusions, and throw a shade on something. All hallmarks of science denial. Rather, we should be asking, is a person making the claim an expert, published in this field, who has actually read, analyzed, and scrutinized more than 12,000 papers and examined 20 years of data on the matter? Thankfully, this is exactly what climate scientists like Australia's own, Cook and others did, and found that 97% of experts in this field agree that humans are the cause of climate change. And that the more specialized you are in this field, the more you support the evidence. My name is Chris Vanastock. If you want to find out more about this, please look me up on YouTube and thanks for watching. All right, that will do it for today. A very short, sweet episode as promised. Um, again, thank you to my awesome patrons for supporting me as well as Tesla Taxi for sponsoring the episode. If you haven't already, smash that subscribe button. It honestly does help the channel. I, I can't say it enough. As well as putting comments down beneath, thanks to everyone who does that by the way, and giving a thumbs up. Plus, actually put on your socials, especially that FYI segment, because yeah, the more we get information out there in the truth in the space, the better, okay? Once, as per usual, all my resources and links are found below, so if you wanna go do some further reading up on it, please do, I highly recommend it. I must say a big shout out this week um, to, uh, I think it's Tom, not Tom Scott, that's the other guy I like watching. I think it's Joe Scott. I'll put his name on the screen now. Apologies, mate. Uh, he's an American, does some awesome work in this space as well. Um, and also, um, yeah, the Skeptical Science website, as well as the authors of those very important papers around, you know, actually proving that scientists do believe that humans are to blame for, you know, climate change. Um, yes, anyway, I've rambled on long enough. Once again, you be good and you be great.